8 o'clock in the morning. In Marrakesh, Gemma Elfna Square awakes to the sound of flutes and bendiers. The Aisawa have already drawn a crowd of the curious around them. But what are all these people waiting for? Why are there so many of them? Because some snakes are venomous, because we think they're dangerous, our fascination for these animals is considerable. Alas, few snakes can stand up to these exhibitions. But the reptiles aren't the only ones exploited on Gemma Elfna Square. Far from its natural habitat, the Barbary macaque, or mago, is also on display. Captured at a very young age, prisoners in tiny cages, these monkeys do insist on making a bid for freedom. What do we know of these animals? What are they? Where do they come from? To better understand them, let's go and see them in the wild, from the vast forests in the north of Morocco to the Great Saharan South. of the Middle Atlas range lies the Ifran Reserve. Its peak is around 2,000 meters altitude. At Ukmas, a thousand-year-old tree overlooks the entire forest. The Guru cedar, 42 meters tall, is 800 years old. It bears the name of a French colonel, Henri-Joseph Guru, who worked in the early 20th century to pacify the Moroccan protectorate. The Guru Sida, dried up since 2003, is the symbol of the Ifran National Park, the largest cedar forest in the world. The Ifran National Park was created in 2004 with the aim of preserving the province's rich natural heritage. Here in this ecosystem, we find 23% of Morocco's species of flora, 46% of birds, 33% of reptiles, and 40% of Morocco's mammals. The monkey is an iconic species in the Ifran National Park. The park contains one of the largest, if not the largest, population in the world of the Mago monkey, which means that today we need to conserve it, to restore its environment, to inform tourists, make them aware of this, and to respect this iconic species that we can still see in its natural environment. The national park covers 50,000 hectares of forest. This once was the territory of the Barbary lion, now unfortunately vanished from the wild. Today, it's the undisputed kingdom of the Barbary macaque. The arrival of intruders in the undergrowth always inspires curiosity. But today, the monkeys are far too busy for man-watching.
there's a bustle of excitement in the Ifran forest. As early as November, males and females pair off for courting rituals. And in a game where the strongest wins, the youngsters are quickly sidelined. The fights are sometimes violent. This old male bears the scars. To avoid clashes, it's not uncommon for males to borrow their young from the females to calm their opponent's ardor. The presence of the little monkey transforms the fight into a cordial meeting, and the two rivals take it no further. But sometimes, too, the young get hurt, caught in the crossfire of a dispute. The Atlas cedar is a variety endemic to the region. Some of the oldest specimens are 1,200 years old. These majestic trees can reach 60 meters tall. The Atlas cedar is distinguished from other cedars by its erect branches and its short, stumpy needles. The Barbary macaque watches over it, getting rid of any harmful insects. In return, the cedar offers food and a solid shelter. But winter is on its way. Soon, a harsh glacial cold will grip the forest and its inhabitants. More than 3,000 kilometers from Ifran National Park, on the border of Algeria and Mauritania lies the Western Sahara. It's here that the naturalist and photographer Michel Emmerich fights the good fight. This reptile-loving, tireless walker has but one mission, to study and protect the animals of the desert the snakes in particular. My experience in Morocco is that the vast majority of people think that all snakes in Morocco are dangerous, that they're all poisonous, especially in the Sahara goes the usual prejudice. Of 25 species, seven are venomous. But most of the time, in terms of probability, statistically, in my experience, the snakes that you encounter the most aren't venomous. I'm interested in the venomous snakes, but they're far harder to find. With its imposing size, sometimes more than two meters long, and a body weight of three kilos, the Montpellier snake is pretty impressive. But this snake, which is off hunting, is totally harmless to man. No doubt for this reason, it is the reptile of choice for the snake charmers in Gemma Elfna Square. Sensing danger, 
the snake rears up. The illusion of the venomous cobra is perfect. Thrill-seeking tourists can wrap the snake around their neck without fear. This pointless act of courage each year costs the lives of hundreds of Montpellier snakes, captured and sold. Today, the species is under real threat. Far away from men, the male Montpellier snake reveals some very strange behavior. Rarely filmed in the wild, the snake rubs its nose all the way along its body. Using its nostrils, the snake deposits a greasy substance. This substance will enable it to lay a trace of its presence on the ground as it slithers along, a warning to any of its fellow creatures to avoid any clashes. Despite the desert aridity and extreme temperatures, the Sahara is teeming with life. For desert animals, the fight for survival is constant and unceasing. That's the case with the crested lark, which wears camouflage to tirelessly inspect the bushes for any seeds or insects. Cantodactylus fully intends to find prey too. Just a vibration in the sand, and here's our little lizard approaching. If a venomous snake had done the same by shaking the tip of its tail, it would have been curtains for him. Another animal, another hunting technique. This is the Argioplobata. Immobile at the center of its web, the spider patiently awaits the visit of an imprudent insect. Gently, gently. Look, there's a snake swallowing... Swallowing what? It's a sand snake. It grabbed it by the head. The little gerbil's fight for life is over. The Shokari sand racer, also called a four-scale sand snake, was the quicker. All that remains is to swallow its prey. You see, this sand snake has shown us that it doesn't just hunt lizards or acanthodactyly, but also little gerbils. That's a big prey for its neck size. It's getting ready to swallow its prey. It doesn't want to lose it. It can't eat that often. It's forgotten us totally, so busy it is with swallowing its prey, it puts itself in great danger. I think this snake is already capable of reproduction, but hasn't reached its maximum size yet. They get bigger than this. It's an epistoglyphus, rear fanged snake, that is harmless to man. So in case of bites, the fangs slide under the skin without penetrating. And in any case, it would never happen, because this snake shoots off at top speed. You really have to jump on it to catch it. And none of those I've captured tried to bite me. We're very lucky to observe it in the wild like this. He's finished, and now he's looking at us, he's observing us. Earlier on, he'd forgotten us. He was so keen to swallow his prey. There he is with his prey in his belly. 
some experts claim that the sand snake bites as soon as it's touched by man's hand. Michel Emmerich doesn't agree, and once again, he proves it. Despite the cold, the rangers of Ifran National Park continue to watch over the forest. <laughs> the carefree play of the young macaques could almost make you forget that winter has moved in. Now, all expeditions where they might get lost and stray from the group are out of the question. More gestures of affection and submission. Now, each individual must exercise patience. Each limits their efforts, saving their strength. Now it's for real. The relentless onset of winter cloaks the entire region in a heavy mist. All the forest's living beings must protect themselves from the cold. Hugging one another, snuggling up, seeking shelter under the branches of the cedars or in the surrounding trees. Parents must protect their young born last spring because the worst is yet to come. The hailstorm will soon give way to the first snowflakes. And then the food will run out. All of the Ifran monkeys have a single shared goal, to hold out until next spring. At the heart of the cedar forest, its natural habitat, North Africa's only primate has shown great adaptability to be able to weather even the harshest winters. Reproduction has become seasonal as its coat has become thicker. Even the end of its tail has shortened over time, thus decreasing the body's surface area exposed to the cold. Now there's an urgent need to feed, as it's first come, first served. At this period of the year, the monkeys don't just eat, they devour. Hawberries, the red fruit of the hawthorn, are rich in protein and a positive godsend. Fruit, seeds, leaves, tubers and roots, not to mention a few insects or scorpions. All these staples make up the diet of Barbary macaques as omnivorous as humans. But recently, a strange phenomenon has alerted the scientific community. The monkey has been stripping the bark from the cedar, its protective tree. 
damage to the forest is becoming alarming. This symbiotic disruption between macaque and cedar has brought together many researchers from Japan, France, and of course Morocco. Professor Mohamed Karo is one of them. He teaches at the National Forestry School in Saleh. For many years, he studied the Barbary macaque in its natural environment. The High Commissariat for Waters and Forests wanted information on a certain number of hypotheses concerning in particular the monkey's behavior with regard to cedars. Lately the monkey has begun to intensively strip the bark from cedars, young cedars, and even from the branches of adult cedars. Imitating their elders, the young macaques eat the branches of cedars. Their sharp little teeth gnaw away at the tree. Hundred-year-old cedars have never experienced such an assault. We closely examined its diet to find out if a need was not being filled by grasses or shrubs in the undergrowth. Because the monkey feeds on grasses, acorns from the ilex, male catkins from the cedar, as well as fruits and shrubs such as Crataegus laciniata, the hawthorn. We pushed the analysis even further. Was the monkey looking for specific nutrients? And we found that the grass cover is lacking in calcium, whereas the bark is rich in calcium. The monkey peels the bark and sucks at its inner surface. As the monkey is one element of the ecosystem, it looks to augment its diet with calcium. The problem lies in its intensity. Bark stripping becomes more intense because of the impoverishment of the grass cover and especially plants favored by the monkeys, the bulbous plants. Throughout the region, shepherds are grazing their sheep, making the monkeys' food less plentiful. Bushes, young shrubs and bulbous plants, so appreciated by monkeys, are swallowed up by an estimated 800,000 head herd. We must manage this ecosystemic balance while taking into account all the components of the ecosystem, the monkeys as well as the grazing sheep. Finding a balance, now that is a real challenge. It's hard for everyone to find a place in such a fragile ecosystem. The reason for this dance performed by the common chameleon is that it wants to move around without being noticed. Its independent eyes offer it two distinct images which never meet in its brain. Michel would be jealous. It's as if the chameleon has two working cameras at all times. With such vision, it's impossible to appreciate relief and distance except when the chameleon fixes both eyes in the same direction. For now, our chameleon is on the lookout for a grasshopper or a fly for its lunch. Another desert reptile flushed out by Michel is the strange Euromastix more commonly known as the spiny-tailed lizard.
spiny tail lets itself be captured easily. But if it feels under threat, it won't hesitate to hit the adversary with its powerful pine cone tail covered with spiny scales. I became interested in Morocco's reptiles mainly because I was born here. I was born in Casablanca and when I was a child I'd see reptiles in our garden. They were a joy to me. So I developed an interest fairly early on and in doing so I acquired knowledge. And that knowledge showed me that, in general, what people thought was misconceived. So on the one hand, I was building up knowledge, yet at the same time noticing that this knowledge didn't match what was said about the behavior of reptiles and snakes. That's what made me want to come to this country, to take photos and contribute to a book that informs, and that recommends respect and even love. If not, then at least respect them enough not to kill them, because reptiles, snakes, poisonous or not, belong to ecosystems, as does all wildlife. Snakes play a useful part, like any other species, scorpions, spiders, birds, butterflies, the various insects. They all have a role, they all interact with one another. So if we exterminate snakes, it leaves a whole chain broken. These animals, like others, must be respected. They're animals just like the rest. Like all snakes, the Moorish viper also has a right to respect and to life. The larger ones often succumb to beatings with sticks or stones. That is, when they're not abducted for the cramped baskets of the snake charmers. It's one advantage is an ochre-colored skin that increases its chances of survival. They're over there. They're on their way back. The encounter with a herd of wild donkeys in the northern Sahara is a rare and intense moment. Deep in the Seguia El Hamra Valley, mirage sometimes gives way to miracle. Fast and fearful, the wild donkey is bigger than its domestic cousin, standing 1.2 meters at the withers. The Tuareg will sometimes capture one or two specimens. These animals are then tamed and put to work. Here, they still live free, a long, long way from men. Was the gecko aware of the danger? Why didn't it flee? Did it sense that the fearsome horned viper wasn't hungry that night? That one's very pretty. Look at that. Big eyes that see all night long. This is the dune gecko, or Stenodactylus petri which is a nocturnal gecko, typical of the Saharan regions, which hunts insects at night. 
It has a pretty face, big eyes. In the day, it seeks out a hole under stones and sleeps. The viper is still in the vicinity, a perfect opportunity for Michel to observe it more closely. It doesn't feel in danger now. It's not very hot. It's weighing us up, avoiding us. This is quite an encounter. To think that there are people who are scared stiff of coming to the Sahara because there are horned vipers. It's not looking for us. It's hunting gerbils, looking for lizards. Fleeing predators, another species of gecko has taken refuge in a tree. Fearless, the Tarantola annularis can be approached. That night, luck smiles upon them. Suddenly, the reserved viper, Echis logogaster, finally appears. I don't believe this. Can you stay still for me? I've searched for it for seven years and now here it is. This is a really rare snake in Morocco. Elsewhere in Africa, it's quite common. The viper's deadly venom is valuable, so it prefers intimidation to attack and rubs its scales vigorously. We call that anti-predator behavior. It's a way of making known to the predator or your enemies that it's there, rather like the rattlesnake in Arizona. So obviously, when it adopts this behavior to humans, it's fatal for the snake. It'll stay like that and get killed. So how can we open its mouth? Careful. With extreme caution, Michel Emmerich abandons the snake to the night now looking forward to meeting the next on his list, the mythical fascinating cobra. In Ifran, spring has finally sprung. The winter has been particularly harsh, but the temperature is slowly rising. Sheep and shepherds find their way to the pastures and watering places. But to the great dismay of park officials, a few flocks are again venturing into the cedar forest. For the macaques, this new intrusion deprives them once again of the youngest shoots that await at the foot of trees. So the monkeys must show patience, for the sheep have invaded the woods, quite determined to graze there until nightfall. Throughout the forest, cedars bear the stigmata of past winters. The wounds made by the monkeys will never heal.
spring returns, bringing a change in routines and habits. Much more than a hygienic measure, delousing represents a form of tactile communication among the macaques, one that fulfills an important social function. These gestures help to strengthen the bonds between the group members. Delousing takes place between mothers and their young, or between adult monkeys. In this case, they are established according to the hierarchical position in the group and a special affinity that may arise between individuals. Some monkeys are already in search of food. A scratch, a stone lifted, an insect, a root. Food is thin on the ground. And if he finds nothing, there'll be grass on the menu. But when you're small, nothing is easy. You imitate what the adults do. What do they look for under stones and moss? Is it a game? You'll have to start fending for yourself now. Spring also heralds the return of tourists, whether on horseback or on foot, to the heart of the cedar forest. The attraction begins at the park gates, where dozens of rather cheeky monkeys come to beg for peanuts. Here, the monkeys are particularly vulnerable. Each year, hundreds of them are victims of poaching. Some end up as prisoners in Jemaile Fna Square in Marrakesh. The rest will leave Morocco, heading for Europe. The most widely used capture technique is easily mastered. Betrayed by hunger, the young macaques eat bread soaked in alcohol, proffered by the poachers. All the men have to do is collect the dazed little animals. A few days later, they're sold for 100 euros apiece on the black market. For park officials, it's very difficult to reconcile tourism and respect for the environment. Despite the warnings, the Barbary macaque's territory is defiled daily. The monkey population is declining. The rate of decline is 33%, with around a third disappearing each year. Deforestation, the pressures of grazing and of tourism, poaching, these are the major reasons for the inexorable decline in the numbers of Barbary macaques. There are only 15,000 still around today, some say fewer. How long will they survive before they, like the Barbary lion before them, have to give up their place for good?
One of the major areas the park is focusing on is communication, public awareness with tourists, local populations, and local stakeholders. We have a rich heritage to safeguard and to preserve. We must manage this so that we continue to see this ecosystem and this slice of world heritage within the Ifran National Park. Michel Emerich is still on the trail of the Naja, the African cobra. Despite the poaching and the increase in trafficking, the naturalist is convinced that there are still some large specimens lurking in the Moroccan desert. When I need to know which animals exist here or there, wherever I happen to be, I usually ask a nomad if I meet one. I ask him what animal species live in his region. <laughs> Despite a precise description of the snakes and the help of his photographic database, the naturalist's task is more difficult than it sounds. When I ask questions about snakes, it's more random. The answers are more vague. Most of the time, the nomads can't really tell them apart. Normally, you should be able to distinguish a cobra rearing up. But in fact, there are other snakes that imitate the cobra. Even the Montpellier snake imitates it in a certain way. And it's very often called Buseca cobra because it's black. So there's a risk of confusion there. But sometimes the description seems accurate to those questioned. Glossy and black rises up high. To me, that confirms that the cobra still exists. Michel Emerich believes in it. Alas, the snake that appeared that night wasn't a cobra. At nightfall, when the temperature drops, the Montpellier snake likes to luxuriate on the still warm asphalt of the blacktop. But the snake runs a real risk because no animal is spared on this road through the desert. For small rodents like gerbils, the road is an insurmountable obstacle. Misfortune for one means gain for another. Like all snakes, the Montpellier snake's jaw is linked by elastic ligaments. In barely 15 minutes, it can swallow a prey much bigger than its head.
Michel Emmerich was right. An oasis in the desert to slake the thirst of man and beast, and suddenly it's the long-awaited encounter with the cobra. To show that a snake never attacks a man without a reason, Michel wants her face off, a private meeting with a cobra. But before that, he'll have to capture it. The head's here. No, 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 no. Don't go away again. Where's he going? Where's his head? This is a real catch. Damn, I'm getting soil all over me. We've reached a stalemate. If I release you, which way will you go? Wait, wait. I'll make him think that... Go on, go on, go on. Where will you go if I release you? Clever thing. He's using every advantage he can find. I've got him. When I get his head, I've got him. And he opens his mouth to impress me. <laughs> this is a record. We'll measure him. I like the way he fought so as to not get caught because he showed all his strength, his determination not to get captured and to live. To the Greeks, as to lots of other people everywhere, the snake was the symbol of health, of life, and featured on the staff of the Greek god Asclepius. As snakes shed their skin and replace it, they appear eternally young. A simple gesture, and our deadly snake gives up. And this peaceful cobra is a real giant. In Morocco, it's a record. More than two meters is a record. Would the snake charmers on Gemma Elfna Square have no power over it? The good thing about cobras, which you can't say about vipers, is that they don't bite the hand that holds them. Mostly, it is a snake's law to be killed. People think a dead snake is worth more than a living one because that way it won't kill a child. But I believe the opposite, because I'm convinced that knowledge can be our savior. Knowledge allows us to distinguish a venomous snake from a non-venomous one. So when someone gets bitten, there's no panic. If they're bitten by a grass snake, they'll know there's nothing to be done. If we learned to take a rational approach to snakes, including poisonous snakes, I believe that we would save lives. After approaching hundreds of snakes, Michel Emmerich was bitten by a horned viper. Luckily, it was possible to save him. The incident changed nothing, though, quite the contrary. He continues to fight his fight for the defense, the recognition, and the respect of Moroccan snakes. How much longer will the snakes and monkeys be exploited in Gemma Elfna Square? Here, as elsewhere, secular traditions are gradually changed into lucrative business, and it's the snakes that pay the price. As for the Barbary macaques, its days are numbered. But may our views on captivity change, so that Morocco's snakes and monkeys can live in freedom for a long time to come.